second letter thing is, that's gonna be crazy. Yeah, I have the surf listening session questionnaire pulled up. Do you want me to drop it in the chat at some point, Kaylee? Yeah, I'm gonna start letting people in. So okay. we might, if you wanna wait a little bit once they're kind of in so that Perfect. they all see it. Yep. Recording in progress. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, we'll wait. everyone. We'll wait. Are you guys getting feedback from my audio? Yes. Feedback from my yes. audio? Yes. 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 Better. Yes, it is. Yes, Wait. It is. Wait. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, good afternoon. everyone. We'll get good started. Good we'll get started. No, okay. no, it's no. bad again. Erica or Kaylee, can you mute everyone? Okay, is this better? Great. Okay, let's try that one more time. Hopefully you guys are not getting um, any feedback. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our second surf listening session at lunch. So you guys should feel free to eat lunch while, um, while, while you're sitting in on this meeting. This is our second session. So um, rather than do a full round of introductions, I'd like to recommend that everyone introduce themselves in the chat. It would be great if you could state um, not just your name, but also um, the organization or entity you're representing and where in the region you are. We were really lucky last time to have someone from all seven of the counties in our listening session. I'm hoping for, um, for that robust participation this time as well. So, um, and um, I also wanted to, to note that the materials from our previous listening session are going to be available in the chat, but they're also available in our SURF newsletter. So if you registered for one of these lunch and learn sessions, you're automatically registered for our SURF um, listening session. And then um, Erica has kindly dropped a, um, a survey in the uh, chat as well for people to participate in that would be quite helpful in our data collection process. Um, we do have several members of our Sierra Business Council team here with us today. So that includes Kristen York, who's Sierra Business Council's vice president and runs our economic empowerment programs. Kaylee Reynolds, who is a program analyst and is assisting in this project. Erica Bacchus, who is our government affairs assistant. And let's see if um, Justine Queeley may be joining us as well, who works on Sierra Business Council's climate programs. So, um, so you have a robust participation from our organization as well. Um, also, it would be um, helpful if you have questions, if you could add, ask the questions in the chat so we can capture the information. Um, the agenda, the presentation portion of this should be relatively short. I wanna save quite a bit of time for item three on our agenda, which is soliciting feedback on the partnership agreement 
the data collection strategy that we are likely to include in the application and the governance model that we've been working on. And I'm hoping that we have some deep conversation on those issues. So um, I think you already know quite a bit about Sierra Business Council if you've been attending these meetings. If not, I would encourage you to look at, um, at our website. Uh, but um, you know, we, we've been working on programs like this throughout the region, and we're really excited to be working on the SURF. Uh, the quick recap, SURF is a one-time use of state general funds that will disperse $600 million to regions across the state of California specifically intended to support inclusive economic development with a focus on disinvested communities throughout the state of California, and also looking at alignment with numerous state um, policies, including the development of low carbon economic development. So there's a lot of emphasis in this program on both disinvested communities, traditionally left behind stakeholders, and meeting some of the state's um, other objectives, including uh, low carbon development. The program is run by the California Labor and Workforce Development Board, the Governor's Office of Planning and, and Research, and the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development. The SURF program objective and design, there are 13 SURF regions throughout the state. We'll be sharing a map in a couple minutes. Each of those 13 regions is going to re receive up to a $5 million planning grant to foster the partnerships and the high road transition collaboratives that are um, stood up in each one of those regions. And those collaboratives would develop a regional economic plan that will then be implemented through a combination of a phase two of the program, which is $500 million in implementation funds that will be awarded across the state based on a competitive process. Uh, but we are advocating for $40 million of those funds going to each one of the regions. But the long-term strategy is for the state to continue to make investments in these economic development plans across the regions through other state programs. So leverage is a really important objective of this program and creating the infrastructure in the communities to enable le leverage after the end of the SURF process. So I think that's something per, uh, really important for us to keep in mind. Um, the SURF timeline as currently laid out, um, the planning timeline for the phase one planning grants will, will take roughly 18 to 24 months. Uh, Sierra Business Council is committed to trying to compress this process closer to the 18 month time period for a variety of reasons. One of the most important reasons is that some of the implementation funding is likely to come available next year. And we would like to be able to have projects in the pipeline when that implementation funding comes available. The timeline on the grant application is that the, um, the, the solicitation was released on May 26th. So we've been organizing around this, not just before then, but at a much higher degree <laughs> after then. Um, the closing of the planning phase solicitation is July 25th. So we have quite a bit of work to, be, to do between now and July 25th. Um, those applications will then be scored by those three aforementioned agencies. And the, um, the plan is for the award for the planning phase grantees to be announced in September and the planning phase projects to be under contract and started in October. And then immediately after the planning phase contracts are awarded, they will release the implementation phase grant guidelines so we'll have the opportunity to look at what the criteria for implementation grants will be as we're working on the planning phase. So, um, so that should be good. A recap of the different regions around the state. We are in the Eastern Sierra region, which includes the counties of Alpine, Mono, Inyo, Mariposa, Tuolumne, Calaveras, and Amador. It's a seven county region. 19,000 square miles, 186,000 people. And um, we've taken the, taken the liberty of, um, of 
identifying some of the current economic drivers that are driving the economy within that region and have done some preliminary data analysis on what some of the potential high growth sectors um, are likely to be within the region. Once again, a reminder that this program is focused on developing what are known as high road jobs, meaning jobs that help move people from lower income levels to higher income levels, pay higher than the area median income in salary and um, show a commitment to kind of advancing um, both low carbon economy, disinvested communities, and, um, and some other state objectives around economic development. So the planning process is likely to focus on um, workforce education and training and high road job development as a main focus. The, um, there are several requirements within, um, within the application phase for us to submit our application in July. And I wanna go over three of those for a broader discussion uh, today. So the first, oh, sorry. Can you go back one, Erica? I accidentally touched my ear. <laughs> um, one of the first requirements is that participants are gonna be required to submit partnership agreement letters from people likely to be uh, participating in that high road transition collaborative. So we are working now on a, a template for that participation agreement letter. Um, each participant would be required to submit a letter to SBC for us then to submit along with our application. That letter is required to lay out the governance structure for the high road transition collaborative. And then each entity would be required to identify a description of their type of entity, a description of their knowledge and experience relative to the project, a primary contact, their role in the process, an email, and a signature page. Um, so we're working on the participation agreement letter right now and should be able to circulate a draft to all of the potential participants starting um, Monday, June 20th. So uh, to be clear, we had hoped to get a participant, partici partici <laughs> uh, a partnership agreement letter rather out earlier, but we literally just got clarification of what is required for that letter in the bidders conference that we were on for the previous two hours. So, um, so we didn't really have clarity on what the partnership agreement letter needed to include and whether it could be a sign-on letter or it needed to be individual letters until 30 minutes ago. Um, so we now have that clarification. We'll start working on those materials and get them out to you shortly. When we, um, when we distribute that participation or that partnership agreement letter, um, you'll, you'll actually get um, three documents. So we'll have a template for the partnership agreement letter a description of what we believe the commitment will be for participating in the process at a couple of different levels. The time commitment relative to the transition collaborative and also um, participation in potential subcommittees. And they are, um, they are different levels of, of time commitment. And then we will also provide a graphic that describes the governance structure and we'll have those out to you on June 20th. So uh, before I go on to the next section, I'm wondering if we have any questions on the uh, partnership agreement letter and the need to submit one. And please feel free to unmute, unmute yourself if you wanna ask questions regarding the agreement letter. Uh, hi, Steve, it's Elaine Kabbalah. Hi, Elaine. Hi, thank you so much for all the work that you guys are doing. You know, it's a lot to navigate and it's a heavy lift and I'm very excited to partner with you. Um, so I'm, I'm with the Eastern Sierra Council of Governments and it is a Brown Act governed body. And I know that that will be an issue for potentially other partners as well. Um, so for planning purposes, when do you need to have that letter? When are you planning to submit? When do you need the letter back from different organizations? So we need to submit our application on the 25th, but we would like to have it done at least a few days before that. 
So we would like to have all of the, the partnership agreement letters back um, the week before, before that, somewhere around uh, July 15th. Okay. And to be clear, we asked for clarification, Elaine, on whether or not uh, partnership agreement letters required board or city council approval for signature. And, um, and the answer we received back was that if an authorized agent of some sort of those entities signed the agreement letter, that would be sufficient. So okay. it's really up to what your internal um, um, kind of rules are for governance of the SCOG. Okay. Um, yes, thank you. I appreciate that. Any other questions regarding the partnership agreement? Steve, I have one. This is John Hopkins. Hey, John. Hey. Um, so with our board, it, I think it's very important to, uh, you had mentioned maybe coming to the board meeting to, to discuss this, what SURF is and what it's going to involve. Um, I know that they would feel much more comfortable uh, doing that uh, if you're able to do that before signing just a, another participation letter because uh, they've done lots for grants. Uh, is that is absolutely that? happy to do that? Okay, so should I just personally send you some dates and times? Yeah, and if it isn't me, depending upon whether or not there's a conflict, it might be someone else on our team. But That's fine. Um, but we will we will have someone attend and uh, you know I recognize even if this is just an informational item yes you know um, um, it, it would be great to do it as soon as possible John yes I will get that going thank you great thank you so much okay bye any other questions regarding the partnership agreement great if not let's move on so. Um, so the second thing I wanted to discuss real quickly is that is the data collection strategy that we're going to be deploying um, and describing within the grant application itself. So um, we are going to need to submit a description of what our strategy is for doing the following things. Number one, stakeholder mapping across the entire seven county region. Um, a regional economic summary, a regional labor market analysis, a regional economic cluster analysis, identification of workforce education and training programs and an analysis of their capacities, a disinvested communities analysis, so identification of key and critical disinvested communities within that seven county region, a regional climate analysis and a public health analysis. Um, and then finally, what our strategy would be for developing some kind of a SWOT analysis or an assessment of the strengths and weaknesses of the economy within the region. Um, and then we will need to use those to discuss alignment with state policy goals, specifically around um, increasing investment in disinvested communities and climate, but also meeting the state's desires for essentially increased um, high road job development. So our current strategy for this, uh, so I, I keep accidentally touching my ear. I, I, I apologize, Erica. That's our secret signal, by the way. Um, our strategy for doing this data at this point that we've been working on would be to contract with the California State University at Chico and their Center for Economic Development to do most of the economic and social data. We think this would make a lot of sense since um, CED is already contracted to do the data analysis for the Central Sierra Economic Development District Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy that is going on right now. And some of that data will be the same data. Plus we have used um, CED for doing data analysis like this in the past, and they've done a super job on it. And finally, 
CED is likely to be the convener of the North State Collaborative. So we've been talking about the idea of having CED do the North Coast, the North State, and the Central Sierra simultaneously um, so that they would then have the ability to look at comparisons between the regions as well. We also plan to lean heavily on the individual county analyses that were done by RCRC, the, regional, the Rural County Representatives of California for economic data. So, um, so we're thinking that um, we would probably describe in our grant application a separate contract with CED for doing that data. Uh, the strategy for the climate data uh, is that likely Sierra Business Council would do that in-house. As many of you know, we've done numerous greenhouse gas inventories and energy action plans and climate plans within the Sierra Nevada region. As a matter of fact, we're working on a couple for some of your jurisdictions right now. Uh, but also we just recently completed a Sierra Nevada wide climate vulnerability assessment um, that is in draft form right now. We're soon to release a public review draft of that. And it has a very in-depth analysis of climate vulnerability down to the community level um, across the Sierra Nevada. So our, our plan would be that we do the climate data in-house uh, based on our existing um, climate planning team. So that's kind of our strategy at this moment. And I'm wondering um, if people have any questions, comments, feelings, ideas about that. Um, we would of course plan to also be using the climate data that each individual entity has, um, has developed. So for example, a very robust process was conducted on the east side around their Eastern Sierra Recreation Collaborative. Um, to look at climate vulnerability for particular assets in the community. So in that process, we would be kind of gathering up all of the information that's been conducted in the region and using that to aggregate, um, aggregate data to inform the process at the same time. So with that, I'd love to open it for any questions or comments on the data strategy that will be included. Seriously, none. <laughs> well, I guess that's settled then. <laughs> we have we have to like it's that. Kathy Galino, you're just so fabulous that there's just not much to discuss. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, this is going to be a pretty robust data collection effort, and just to be clear um, for you guys. This is like this and staffing the effort are probably the two like highest costs that you're likely to see within the budget, right? So, um, so th th this is a pretty robust. Oh, by the way, the reason the public health analysis has an asterisk next to it is that we haven't quite figured out um, whether or not we're going to do that in house through Center for Economic Development or we might need to go out of house to find someone else to assist with the public health analysis. I think as you guys know, the California Department of Public Health has pretty robust county by county analyses, but it doesn't necessarily cover all of the things that would need to be covered for this project. So we don't have a clear um, finalized strategy on that yet. Great. So let's um, move on to the, to the fun item. So this is the item that has actually taken quite a bit of work over the last um, couple of weeks, thinking through the high road transition collaborative governance structure that is likely to be included in the application. And this is our best shot to date, just so you guys know. I also wanna be clear before we walk through this, that there will be an opportunity to shift this governance structure post application if we need to. Um, so, um, so this is not etched in stone. 
but, um, but we do need to have a draft governance structure to submit with the application. So this is kind of what we have come up with. So let me walk through this real quick and then we'll open it for conversation. So what we're envisioning is a high road transition collaborative council, which we may rebrand with a different name since very few people are used to that jargon in our region. Um, but we're envisioning a council of 21 members um, and then a separate individual who will chair that council who is a non-voting chair. And the rationale behind a non-voting chair is that they can manage the meetings, uh, but they're not actually, they don't have stake in the, um, in the outcome of an individual decision that is being made. That council would be comprised of three people from each county or cities within the counties. Um, and we can discuss the process for selection after we walk through the, um, the structure itself. Um, then that, that council is served by five subcommittees. Uh, an equity, climate, and labor subcommittee, a business and workforce subcommittee that looks at um, not just business development issues, but also workforce education and training assets and opportunities, a local government committee that includes all of the local jurisdictions, including counties, cities, and special districts who choose to participate, a data planning and drafting committee. So this is the committee that would be primarily charged with drafting the elements of the economic development strategy for the region, and then a project committee. And the project committee would be, would be chartered with essentially developing a project selection criteria and advancing projects based on that criteria in batches to the council for their approval. So the five chairs of the committee would serve on the council. So there's cross pollinization between the individual committees and the council itself. And then um, the, the, the membership in the committees would be open to ex officio membership. So each committee would have seven voting members per committee, but the committee membership would actually be open to any community or organization that wishes to participate. Um, and those seven voting members would be comprised of at least one voting member from each county. Um, and as I said, those committee chairs would serve on the HRTC council in order to ensure cross collaboration. And then decisions of the committee would matriculate to the, to the board, to the council for approval. The decision-making process that we are proposing is what's known as a modified consensus process, which means that when decisions are called in either the committee or at the council, there's an initial um, straw poll where people identify whether they can support the decision, they can live with the decision, which kind of means they can, they're going along because the entire committee is recommending something they abstain from a decision or they oppose. If they oppose a decision, they have the ability to state their opposition and make their case. And then the decision-making process reverts to a voting model with a majority vote on operational decisions. So these are decisions about things like, what are the public outreach processes? And what are the stakeholders that we're gonna um, seek to engage? What are the budget decisions that need to be made, things like that. Um, but a two thirds vote requirement for projects to matriculate both to the council and to pass out of the council. And the rationale behind the two thirds vote and the advancing projects in batches is that it would kind of require consensus on the part of the council on projects moving forward, that it would be difficult to block a project, but it would also be difficult um, kind of to not reach a decision on a batch of, of projects um, collectively. Um, now, once again, there's a caveat in this that as new stakeholders are identified, it is possible that this council um, 
this council might might change in its composition and that would be up to the council to decide at a later date so uh, there's a question from melissa about the charge of the local government committee i think the purpose of the local government committee is really kind of threefold number one is to ensure that the strategies developed are um, at least considering if not consistent with already existing local government economic development strategies that are included in your planning documents or that they go beyond those. So, um, so I think it ensures a certain level of kind of consistency um, with existing processes that exist in the region. Number two, it would be to conduct outreach and to keep all of your decision makers informed in the process. So I would envision members of that local government committee doing regular updates to their boards of supervisors, city councils, or um, special district boards of directors in order to ensure that we have buy-in throughout the process. And then I think the third role of the local government committee would be to help advance projects to the project committee for consideration based on either your existing economic development plans and strategies or your capital improvement plans or other objectives that are identified throughout the process. So, so um, that's our governance structure that we are proposing and it is open for discussion. No other questions on that? I'm kind of, I'm kind of amazed. Yeah, I, I, this is Elaine again, Stephen. I'd just say um, thank you for putting, it seems like that's a lot of problem solving in a short period of time. So thank you uh, all at SBC for putting your heads together to come up with some solutions. So as you guys know, we've been doing some trips around the region, conferring with people individually. As a matter of fact, I've met with, oh, I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> Erica, I'm doing that again. <laughs> Don't move on yet. Um, I've met with many of you individually to talk about this. I think there are a couple of things to think about in this governance structure. So number one, a couple of people have um, expressed some concern about what the time commitment is likely to be on both the High Road Transition Collaborative Council and on the committees. I'm envisioning 18 months, monthly one and a half to two hour meetings of the council and at a minimum monthly meetings of the committees. So SBC would be staffing the council and the committees. So documents would be advanced, um, you know, before the, well before the meetings for discussion. Uh, there would be ongoing dialogue with the committee members between the meetings so that we can make sure that the meetings are productive and relatively, you know, relatively compact, but still allow for a lot of feedback and discussion, um, but you know this is a substantial time commitment to to ask someone to serve on a council where you know the commitment is at least one and a half to two hours a month plus whatever the time is for document review, and for five of those people to be also serving as committee chairs, which means they're committing more like you know two to three days a month of working on this plan. Um, is a pretty substantial time commitment. So some people have expressed concern that we're not going to be able to find, you know, essentially the 30 people um, that will stick with this process from beginning to end. Um, I'm, I'm not so sure that's going to be that much of a problem, but I'm wondering what you guys think about that commitment and whether or not people are willing to make that commitment. Okay, sounds like they are. <laughs> this is Steve, but did you mention if it's gonna be in Zoom or on Zoom or in person? So yeah, we've been, we've been thinking about how we would manage these meetings. And, um, and by the way, Megan, if you have a really good idea for a very well designed room for hybrid meetings on the east side, I'd love to hear it either Megan or Elaine. Um, 
But, um, but I think these meetings would likely be held at the Motherlode Job Training Center in Sonora because of how well networked um, that room is. Like I have never seen a better designed room for doing hybrid meetings than that one. None of the typical technology challenges come up around sound or video or anything else. Um, so I think we would likely base a portion of the meeting live at the Motherlode Job Training Center and then participation from across the region could be either in person or by a video conference. And if we could find a similar setup on the east side, then we could move the meetings back and forth between the east and the west slope of the Sierra um, throughout the process. So that, yeah. that's kind of our current plan. Steve, we just, um, you know, to be consistent with all the, you know, Brown Act Zoom stuff, uh, the city of Bishop just invested in a whole infrastructure for conducting virtual and in-person meetings. Um, and it's it's a pretty good setup. I used it last week to um, conduct dual location meetings in Inyo and Mono County. Um, it's not the most flexible room, so I think you know as the needs need to be determined. But we have a few spaces now set up well on the on the east side to accommodate um, remote and in person meetings. That's that's great. That's fantastic. Maybe See, even the business know, we, resource center eventually. Yeah. <laughs> I, my hope is to have a really great setup at the Business Resource Center come probably October timeframe. Um, and if there's a really good model that we should be checking out in Sonora, I would love to get linked up with that um, so we can figure out what they're doing right that we could replicate. Yeah, you should go look at their setup because I was blown. I was absolutely blown away at how good it is. Like, hey, Steve, uh, Robin had a really great comment. Which yeah, I'll get, I'm, I'll, I'll get to the questions. Awesome. So, okay. so yeah, um, Robin, I, I agree. It is going to be hard um, uh, to identify and engage disinvested groups to find time for these meetings. So we plan to set aside a substantial portion of the budget to compensate um, community-based organizations, tribal entities, et cetera, for their participation in this process. And we also plan on doing some trainings um, on, on how to participate in processes like these for everyone involved as, as part of kind of the, the ramp up to the regular meetings. So there will be budget available for those, um, for those entities to participate. So, and then I know we have questions from Kathleen and John as well. Why don't we go to Kathleen next? All right, thank you. Um, and thank you for this presentation. I'm a supervisor in uh, Tuolumne County. And uh, you had asked a question, I couldn't raise my hand fast enough, sorry, uh, regarding staff capacity. And I think uh, Tuolumne County fits in pretty well with a lot of the other mother load counties, but I won't speak for them in uh, capacity issues for staff. We just really are limited. And so when you asked a question about will this uh, work, uh, you know, timing wise and the time it will take uh, for participation, I think it's going to be a fine line between capacity issues and how to schedule. Of course, scheduling the further out uh, you can schedule will uh, help secure people uh, to those spots. But assuming we have staff that we can de devote to this, you know, their, their time is pretty taken. So it'll be a good trick to be able to schedule where everybody could, that you've identified for this program will be able to come. So those are my concerns. Good, very good points, Kathleen. Um, I, I would hope that what we can do is establish standing meeting times um, that don't conflict with, um, with like other official functions like boards of supervisors meetings or city council meetings or, or other board meetings. And then um, really work hard to do as much by um, email and documentation and even one-on-one -on -one conversations with both council members and committee members. So we make sure that the actual hard meeting times are kept to an absolute minimum. Um, 
but I, I totally get I totally get your concern. Uh, let's go to John and then Ben. Steve, you when you met with us here, uh, I think I mentioned the same thing. I just want to echo what Kathleen uh, had mentioned, and the resources are pretty thin in small cities, small counties uh, to participate. So, as much notices the uh, as you guys can give for what it is you're going to be looking for in the future will certainly help us. Uh, that was a comment. Yeah. No, that's that's fantastic. Um, I, I do think um, we need to be thinking about not taxing the capacities of the local entities, but also making sure that all of their priorities are getting into this process as well. So, um, you know, I would hope that um, if we are successful in securing $40 million of that $500 million fund for projects in the region, and it could be used to leverage other state and federal funds, that that would make it truly worthwhile for the local jurisdictions to participate at, at a high level. I, I think that's um, a really good point, though, and I think we should be thinking about when are we, like, how are we scheduling this so it doesn't um, tax local government? So, and, you know, um, Ben, I see your question in the chat. Um, I'll, I'll like re replay that again. It seems that the commitment is needed for the su success of the plan when we get into the competitive grant application phase. And, and I think that that indeed is true. I think that part of the criteria for selection of implementation projects is likely to be um, at least partly based around the, um, the, the diversity of participation. So I think there's two challenges there, not just getting the participation of um, all of the local governments and local government entities, but also getting the, the participation of the community-based organizations that are necessary. So I, I think that's a really good point. Uh, Robert, um, Robert, why don't we go to you next? Okay, great. No Hey, it's uh, been a fantastic presentation, and and uh, what I've seen in, in terms of your structure is, I believe, well ahead a lot of the a lot of the regions. It's not a competition, but it's it's uh, very well thought out, and I'm impressed. I, you know, on the on the question of sort of bandwidth of organizations and people's times, um, I'd, I'd make the suggestion that where possible, uh, with our organizations that participate, might be a good idea to have. Um, both kind of a primary participant and an alternate um, to provide some flexibility on participating in, in a lot of the meetings and committee meetings. And, and I think that would allow, it might allow as you start to structure the committees, the flexibility to have an alternate on the committee. So I just wanted to throw that out there because it might uh, allow a little bit of flexibility and the ability to spread some of the time out amongst existing staff. And I know with RCRC, while we, we're pretty, you know, relatively large organization. We're really focusing our four, four members of the economic development team to support uh, the regions that have our CRC members uh, throughout the state. So, and we're briefing each other on a weekly basis on what's happening in each region. So I just wanted to put that out there, if that's okay. Yeah, we're really looking forward to the active participation of our CRC in this, in this process. So, uh, but I think that's a really good idea. I think we should allow for both, you know, um, uh, primary and um, alternative um, um, entities for each individual on both the council and the committees. That makes a lot of sense to me. So, um, so you, Steve, can I can I add something? Um, and that it goes back to some of the other questions on the disinvested communities. We've had really great response from the jurisdictions and, and uh, certain groups. We could definitely use some help if in your jurisdictions, you can refer us to some of the community benefit organizations or groups that you know uh, want to be involved in this process, could use some capacity development and would benefit from this process. So we are open to that and connections are welcome. Thanks. Yeah, uh, we, we actually, I um, we have a slide coming up where we're going to be asking for data from you guys on a couple of things, including suggested stakeholders. So to answer um, 
uh, Robin's question directly. Yes, absolutely reach out to Tawny about the Bishop Chamber coming on as a partner. Um, the partnership letter um, is really about who's a partner in the process. It isn't necessarily just who's on the HRTC Council, right? So as many of those partnership letters as we can get, we would like to get before we submit the application. And we're really looking for a diversity of participation. So chambers, um, community-based organizations, um, we're, we're kind of light on labor and workforce organizations. So we'll be reaching out, uh, we'll be reaching out to them. So yes, the partnership letters are open to anyone who would like to um, who would like to participate, Melissa? The slides will be included um, in our newsletter, and we can probably send them out separately to everyone on this email as well. Um, and then also, how the committee members will be selected. So, Erica, if you could go to the next slide. <laughs> so, let's talk about who the required stakeholders are, and then John, I'll get to your question in just a second. So part of the trick on that HRTC council and the committees is that throughout that process, either through council representation or committee representation, we, try, we, we need to try to have as many of the required stakeholders involved as we can. And they are listed here. So it includes employers, businesses, and business associations and organizations within the region, labor organizations, um, community-based organizations, government agencies, economic de development agencies, philanthropic agencies. So we should be reaching out to um, the community foundations with, with it, within the region, um, education and training providers. So we're clearly going to want um, Columbia College and Saracosa College involved as much as possible, uh, workforce entities, environmental justice organizations, which we have been having a difficult time identifying. We know of several environmental organizations and collaboratives. I have a meeting later on today with the Latino Community Foundation to talk about, um, well, it's actually with the Latino Community Foundation and California Endowment to talk about organizations that they've granted to within the region that might be likely partners, uh, disinvested communities, tribal entities, and other regional stakeholders. So I think in the selection, if you can go back to the governance model, please, Erica. I think in the selection of the committee members, um, we're gonna need to be considering that stakeholder matrix and how they fit into these committees and or the council, either as one of the three representatives from each county or cities within the counties, or as a, as a, um, as a, uh, a committee member or a, a voting member or as an ex officio member. So what I'm envisioning is like some kind of nomination process, a matrix, that goes through the stakeholder needs and then a selection process based on that matrix um, for essentially appointments to the committees. Well, anyone who wants to be on a committee can be on a committee, but appointments to the voting roles in the committees and the HRTC council, looking to get diversity of representation across the entire region. So uh, we're gonna need to consider both the stakeholder diversity and geographic representation across the region as well. So Melissa, this selection process is not gonna be um, easy. You know, I, I think we're, we'll probably look at standing up some kind of nominating process, selection committee, and then having the council kind of self appoint based on um, the criteria for selection, so. Uh, John? Steve, I was just gonna, I, I sent you our uh, our SEDS, Amateur County completed a SEDS here recently last year. And it's got, it lists all of our stakeholders through that. I'm assuming that that's a good document to provide to you. And if you guys want something more 
someone would reach out from the Sierra Business Council to let me know? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, consider us reaching out now. Erica, can we go <laughs> forward um, to the slide that Smart says guy. what else we need? <laughs> uh, no, uh, back one. So, um, so here's, here's what we need most to help in development of the application that we're like, bury us in emails. You'll see a separate surf email at the end of this session today. So we are seeking like specific information on who we can reach out to as stakeholders um, in the tribal community, environmental justice advocates or communities. So even looking at in the environmental justice issue, looking at organizations that are doing um, like family supportive services and other things. I am wondering if there are church-based organizations like Catholic Community Services that are active in any of these sub-regions. Um, uh, labor organizations, I plan to have a more in-depth conversation with Dave Taney about um, labor representatives uh, from, within the, from within the region. I've also reached out to the North Valley Labor Federation um, to identify labor organizations within the region who could be recruited. Uh, individual, like good community members who are, have a history of like working for community betterment, uh, community organizers and other public agencies. I actually think um, particularly the public agencies that either provide um, workforce education and training services or like, so for example, the community college is really important. Like, uh, but also um, I think some of the special districts will be important as well, like in particular utility um, and, and districts like that. Yes, Kathy, healthcare, absolutely. Like it would be great if we had kind of a major healthcare organization on that um, HTC council, because uh, that is a significant consideration within the region. So we need stakeholders. We need you to help us identify additional stakeholders. And then any information you have on existing economic development or climate planning in the region, including the names and contacts at workforce training entities. I'm also working with Dave on that, who has a really good map of all of the workforce education and training um, opportunities on the West Slope. Um, Elaine and Megan, I'm weaker on um, the east side. Um, so workforce training entities, um, broadband plans, climate mitigation and adaptation measures or plans that have been done within the region. We're kind of fortunate there that we've done a lot of them. So we have a lot of those in our database, but you know, the, the, the work that Tuolumne County is doing, we need to incorporate into this and others sustainable tourism planning that has been done. The Eastern Sierra Recreation Group has done a lot. I'm curious if any similar effort exists on the west side. I know Miraposa recently did their um, master, uh, their parks master plan and resiliency plan. So that's definitely in the mix and SEDS documents that are available. And then finally, like don't, don't, don't feel shy about giving us like recommendations about long-term goals for the process, new ideas that people have been kicking around and think might be effective in the region, big picture plans that any of the counties or the jurisdictions or the organizations have. So like you can bury us in recommendations at this point and we'll sift through all of it. So that's what we need from you, John. <laughs> I would just say, be careful what you ask for. <laughs> I don't know. We kind of read everything. So um, any other questions? Kathy, do you have anyone specific in mind around health care? Yeah, we have, um, we have Mark Twain Healthcare District. Um, I know there's Adventist. So there's some, some good connections that we have there. Yeah, I reached out to Adventist and haven't heard back yet. So, but I might not have the right contact. So if you have contacts in healthcare, um, that would be great. 
Um, okay. the, the hospital um, district in Bishop was really involved in the community meeting we did over there. We plan on recruiting them on the east side as well. So, okay. um, and I think they could be really like not, they're, they're also like amongst the largest employers in the region. Absolutely. So, you know, um, so they, they have both the, you know, the public health lens and the employer lens. So, so Steve, I wanted to um, first thank you for yesterday's presentation for my board. You were fabulous. Knocked it out of the park. Oh, good. Thanks. Um, but second, I wanted to kind of share with the group, and maybe you want to touch on it, that as we're looking and, and thinking about projects from a regional seven county perspective, there's a couple things that the funding can't be used for, right? So we talked a little bit about like broadband because there's different buckets of money for broadband as well as housing. I think that those are two challenges that we have regionally, but this SURF funding doesn't really cover that, correct? Yeah, so let's let's talk about that for a minute and then we'll, um, we'll get back to your question, uh, Robert. Um, so in our discussions with the three agencies, they have indicated that um, that social infrastructure necessary to get to broadband or housing projects, such as um, capacity and organizations, um, assessments or analyses that's necessary to qualify for funding for HCD grants, things like that could be included in the implementation projects, but the direct infrastructure investments in broadband and housing are not going to be looked on as favorably as some other areas because there are separate pots of funding stood up by the state over the last two years for those infrastructure investments. So there's been a major investment in broadband funding um, that, um, that is managed through the Public Utilities Commission and the, uh, the CASF, the Advanced Services Fund. And then there's also been a $22 billion investment in both homelessness and housing through HCD, so that direct infrastructure asks would likely be directed to those agencies. But other things that are necessary to get to those could be implementation projects. So for example, some kind of community collaboration around solving the housing issue. Um, we have a model for that in the North Lake Tahoe Truckee area called the Mountain Housing Council. It's a really good model that could be replicated in other areas of the Sierra. Um, I know that Mariposa County has been tracking that effort as well. So, um, so you know, I think the idea here is get as much leverage as possible, right? That if, if we have GoBiz in our corner and OPR in our corner going to HCD saying, these are surf related projects, we prefer you fund them, that's going to be a big leg up on those projects. So, um, uh, Robert, you had a comment. Oh uh, yeah, no, I and I my comment was from kind of a past subject here, and I wanted I didn't want to distract you because that was a really important uh, question and, and response, and I think that you were right on. I, uh, you know, I I I'd add to that. I, I wouldn't be dissuaded from looking at some of those uh, large scale project to project themes. That are well funded, uh, and looking at it from the point standpoint also of capacity building to yes. be able to leverage for for further funds uh, and and technical support to draw out the strategy. So uh, keep an eye on that as well. I and um, going back, you know, I I'm, this is kind of an odd uh, suggestion, but it's it's actually been taken really well in other regions in your in your outreach. Um, to organizations, uh, nonprofits, faith-based groups, you know, all of all of those. What's been helpful is if you look back at the census, hard to count committees. Um, so all the most of the counties put together these committees. That the whole task was to bring in people that would be essentially hard to count, or they um, they would basically need. Um, additional information, incentives, those types of things to draw them into this. So um, uh, I think that if you can look back at some of those committees, you might find um, uh, additional groups that would be in, very interested in being a part of this. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there because I, I think it's a- Yeah, that's a super good idea. Well, and I, I think 
didn't most of the local jurisdictions also put together um, community efforts around um, the homeless count that was done during the middle of COVID that included a lot of social service organizations and others? That would be a good a good place to look too as well. That's a great idea, Bob. We'll make sure that we um, try to get that information. Also super important to note on that, that this is why it is likely or it is possible for that governance model to shift a little bit over time. I think what's likely to happen is that we will have stakeholders who didn't know about this process at the beginning that will kind of emerge as we're, you know, once the grant is awarded and we're doing public outreach um, that we weren't really thinking about. And we're going to need to find a way to incorporate um, everyone in this process. So um, okay, other comments or questions around that? I think we've we've reached our time. So maybe um, Erica, if you can go to that. Yes, that.